Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. I'm Marin, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure that your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth webinar. Our upcoming webinars will be on the 5th of September with Catherine Grant. And then following that, um, we will have a webinar on the 12th um, that will be announced um, at a later date on our Facebook page, as well as on our website. Um, if you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to the recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. During the webinar, if you have any technical technical difficulties, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from Sarah Stoddard, who will be giving a presentation on Y-DNA and uh, MT-DNA. We um, will start the presentation in just a minute. Um, I'll introduce Sarah. If you haven't uh, seen her previous webinar on DNA, uh, you can find that on our website. Sarah Stoddard graduated from BYU in 2009 with a degree in family history. She's done professional research in several companies since then. She specializes in German and general uh, United States research. She also has a current uh, she is also currently serving as um, a missionary here at the BYU Family History Library on the Sunday shift. Sarah is a mother of two kids, and she and her husband met while both working here at the library. The Stoddards live in Orem, and both are very passionate about family history. Sarah's interest in family history started in childhood when she, when she um, loved hearing stories from her older relatives. Her interest in DNA also started in childhood when she realized she was the only left-handed, red-headed, glasses-wearing person in her immediate family, and she got curious about where those traits came from. When DNA testing became widely available about six years ago, Sarah quickly had herself and all of her four grandparents tested. Since then, she's turned up surprise cousins for a couple of her grandparents and has zeroed in on the family of previously identified of a previously unidentified second great-grandfather. She loves a good puzzle and has used her training as a family history researcher, plus her understanding of DNA testing to help numerous adoptees and others solve their elusive family histories. So if um, you just would wait one moment, I'll uh, bring up Sarah's presentation and we can start. So my previous webinar was about autosomal DNA testing, which is the kind that people have usually heard of. It's the kind that's offered by large companies such as Ancestry and 23andMe. But for my presentation today, I'm going to be talking about two other kinds of DNA testing you can use to solve some very specific research questions. These two types of tests are called Y-DNA and MT-DNA tests. So I'm just going to review first some of the information I went over last time about the different types of DNA testing. Um, as I mentioned before, we share about 99.9% .9 of our DNA with every other human on the planet. So DNA tests tell us the unique things about ourselves that are that different 0.1%. There are three main types of tests that look at different types of unique DNA that we have. One of these is autosomal, which is the type of test that can give you an ethnicity breakdown, it can tell you you're 50% English, you're 25% West African, etc. And it can tell you how closely you're related to someone else who has tested. Autosomal changes quickly over the generations because you get half of it from each of your parents, they got half from each of theirs, etc. Which is why and how it can predict how closely you relate to another person very specifically. Why DNA and mtDNA are a little bit different. They both change slowly over the generations. They're inherited differently from one another. Uh, y DNA is inherited from father to son, father to son. They're the only ones that pass it down is on the male line. Mutations on the Y chromosome 
can happen randomly, but they incur infrequently. mtDNA tests your mitochondria, which is a specific part of your cells that has its own unique kind of DNA, and it comes down through your maternal line. You got yours from your mother, she got from hers from hers, but males or females both have mtDNA. So if you look at this chart, it just kind of diagrams out how Y-DNA and mtDNA are inherited. Because of this inheritance pattern, only men can have their Y-chromosome DNA tested, and it only represents the direct male line. Men or women can have mtDNA tested because all of them inherit that from their mother, but only a woman can pass her mtDNA down. So we'll discuss mtDNA first. Uh, Ladies first, it's just also a little bit simpler. Its applications to genealogy research are more basic. Um, it changes slowly over time, but what's hard about studying mitochondrial DNA is it doesn't mutate at a steady or consistent rate necessarily. Sometimes a population can develop unusual mutations more quickly. It can be for random unknown reasons. It can be due to a population being isolated or something called a bottleneck event where a famine or something of the sort leads only to a small number of people from a previously larger group surviving and passing on their DNA. There are different groups of mtDNA that are called haplogroups. Basically, if you share a haplogroup with someone, it means your mtDNA is very similar, though it's not necessarily identical, but what that means is that you have a direct female ancestry from the same part of the world thousands of years ago. After that, the more mutations you share that are identical to someone in your haplogroup, the more recently that shared ancestor is. It's limited in its use for genealogy because even if you're the in, in the exact same haplogroup as someone and have the exact same mutations as them, it could mean you share a female ancestor a few generations ago, but it could mean you share one 500 years ago. There are subgroups of the haplogroups where science has recently tried to refine what a haplogroup tells you a little bit more, which we'll talk about on the next slide a little bit. So haplogroups are represented with alphabetical letters A through Z. Each of these letters represents a population that originated in a different part of the world by studying these different groups and seeing how they differ from one another, science has come to the conclusion that the most ancient mitochondrial DNA groups come from Africa. The group that's considered the oldest one is called L1. Sometimes science will even test mitochondrial DNA in fossils and will um, be able to tell which group ancient people belong to. So this is interesting, but it's limited as to how it can apply to um, genealogy research. So there's a, a few ways we'll talk about that it can apply. So this is just an example of a who did take an mtDNA test, kind of what your results would look like. These are my grandfather's results. Like a lot of people, he took this test out of curiosity about 10 years ago. Basically, all it gave him was a map of where his haplogroup was from, which was haplogroup H at the time, which was a very common European haplogroup, gave him a list of which mutations he had, not a whole lot of information. But this story is also an example of the science of mtDNA is progressing, and they are learning more about it as they study it more. Over the past 10 years, there's been more research done on mutations and different subgroups within haplogroup H. Within the past year, a researcher in Newfoundland, which is where my grandpa's mother's family is from, published some findings about there being a unique subset of haplogroup H that's only found in people with Newfoundland ancestry, pretty much. They call this group, this subgroup, H5A5. And this researcher, whose name is David Pike, theorizes that there was probably one person who immigrated to Newfoundland in its early days, probably in the 1600s, who brought this haplogroup there. There were very few women who were living in Newfoundland at the time. It was mostly fishermen and 
fur traders and so forth. And so this one woman's um, mtDNA w- had a sort of a disproportionate influence over the next few generations or even few centuries on this island if she were someone who had daughters who also then went on to have daughters and were a lot of the early women in this uh, isolated location. And to date, about 10% of people from Newfoundland who've had their mtDNA tested have this very unique DNA signature that's found almost nowhere else in the world. So this is just kind of an example of um, findings that are coming that may provide, you know, future historical and maybe even genealogical knowledge that could be more useful from mtDNA testing. So this sort of answers kind of the first question of why or the it describes the first answer of why you might take an empty DNA test. If you just are interested in the science of it and human migration, sometimes this can help you a little bit with your family tree because you may not know where your end of line female ancestor there came from. And this could point you in a direction of a, a general region or ethnicity to look at. So the ethnic origins part can be interesting I took one of these tests about 10 years ago myself and learned my ethnic origins on my direct female line were actually African, which was a surprise to me because as far as I knew, that line of my family was Portuguese, which led me to do some more research as to how African ancestry might have come into that region of Portugal approximately during the time where my line ended, which may provide useful things for me to consider when I research in the future. You can also use mtDNA to support or disprove a very specific relationship on the female line. So, for example, if you didn't know who your second great-grandmother was on this maternal line because of an adoption or some other situation, you may have some clues, whether it's through autosomal DNA or other research you've done, of who this ancestor is. You may even know of who some of her other descendants are that maybe have more of a proven paper trail than you do. So you could test other descendants that are proven descendants of this woman that you think is your ancestor and see if the DNA matches. If it doesn't, it rules it out. If it does match, it doesn't necessarily mean yes, for sure. That's how you're related, but it, it gives you somewhere further to research. You can also join groups or projects related to your mtDNA haplogroup or to the region of the world that that line of your ancestry comes from, even if you're from a specific ethnicity, say you're Jewish, there are Jewish mtDNA projects out there. And what these projects do is allow you to um, collaborate with others who have similar research interests to you and similar ancestry to you. So, as far as who takes an mtDNA test, anybody can take it, male or female. Everybody has mitochondria, so everybody has mitochondrial DNA. Or if you're ans- trying to answer a specific research question, a direct female line descendant of a female ancestor, you have questions about. The process, there's only one company that does mtDNA testing, though there are some other um, companies out there, I believe, that'll just tell you your haplogroup. But the main company that does these tests is Family Tree DNA. You have two levels of tests you can take, either an mtDNA plus or an mtDNA full sequence. For most research questions, the mtDNA plus is sufficient. Full sequence is more if you're interested in just more detailed information about subgroups of some of these haplogroups, like the example of the H5A5 in Newfoundland. But for most things, the mtDNA plus is going to tell you your haplogroup, going to tell you some basics about who you match. So you would order this kit from Family Tree DNA. You'd follow the instructions. It's a cheek swab test and then mail in the sample. Why DNA is a bit of a bigger topic. It's going to be a little bit longer of a discussion because there's a little bit more you can do with it. It's passed on on the Y chromosome, father to son, down to his son and so forth. So a Y DNA test checks for mutations on the Y chromosome. 
the Y chromosome is a lot more predictable than the mitochondrial DNA. It averages one mutation every 150 years. And so researchers can use that number to kind of estimate the relationship between two people who have the same Y haplogroup and a lot of the same um, mutations on their Y chromosome. It's useful for historical research, also useful for surname research because of this, uh, this specific rate at which it mutates. You can do things from long ago as far as human migrations and the human migration pattern that they've been able to discern from Y DNA also points to the oldest Y DNA haplogroups being found in nomadic peoples in southeastern Africa. And the most ancient groups are haplogroups A and B, though they have, again, letters A through Z. They have subgroups similarly to mitochondrial DNA. So obviously this is of interest to scholars, scientists, historians. I just have a couple of um, titles there of articles you could read to see some of these applications. The first article talks about actually studying um, ancient human remains in, on the Iberian Peninsula in Portugal and Spain, and how by testing the Y chromosomes of these preserved skeletons, they've been able to see that some sort of mass immigration or conquest took place in Southern Europe in a roughly 2500 BC, because the Y chromosome signatures they found in these skull skeletons changed drastically between 2500 BC and about 2000 BC. And if you've heard anything about Genghis Khan historically, you may have heard that he possibly had a lot of posterity and there's been genetic evidence to found to back that up. They've taken samples of a lot of men's Y chromosomes in the regions of Asia that were supposedly conquered by the Mongols under Genghis Khan. And they've actually found a specific unique Y chromosome signature that based on the mutation rates and the locations that it's been found, they're pretty sure it originates from about a thousand years ago and um, matches up where it's found with the places that Genghis Khan conquered. So they're assuming that that is the Y chromosome signature of Genghis Khan and possibly his male relatives that were part of his army. And it shows up in actually about 8% of people with Asian, with Asian origin in this region. But uh, get taking it down to you and your individual family tree and what you can do with Y DNA. Let's pretend you have a common surname, something very common like Johnson. Why testing yourself and other Johnsons who come from the same state or area as your ancestors can help you sort all those Johnsons out, can help you know if they're all related, if they are different groups of Johnsons. It's very common for, you know, previous research compiled genealogies to attempt to link all the people from the same area with the same surname together, because it is very common for families to settle in the same area. But why research can sometimes prove that this is not actually the case. And we had a situation like this in my dad's family line, which I'll discuss a bit at the end. There are also cases where maybe you're pretty sure the surname was changed from what it was originally was. You might have a male ancestor who was illegitimate or adopted, took a stepfather's name, changed his name when he moved states or moved countries, and why DNA testing can give you a clue as to what surname you or your male ancestor would have carried if these things hadn't happened. If you are a Johnson, but you find yourself matching with a bunch of Schaefer's, then you're like, oh, maybe it should have been Schaefer. So like with mtDNA, it can tell you the ethnic origin stuff, which again can be just kind of a general clue if you were expecting that line to be European and your Y chromosome comes up African or Native American, that may affect what kind of research you end up doing. So who tests? You can test yourself if you're male or if you're a representative of the line you're interested in. But whoever tests needs to be DNA related through the male line to the person or family you have a question about. 
So it could be your father, your brother, another male relative, as long as they're a direct male line descendant of whatever line you're interested in. You can also um, recruit people to test who have the surname you're interested in researching, even if you don't know their relationship. If you have a name, say, like O'Reilly, that you know is from Ireland, but you don't know exactly where from or how it got back there, you could hypothetically ask O'Reilly's in Ireland to take the test and see which ones you connect with, and that may help you find your roots in that place. So the only company that currently sells Y-DNA tests is Family Tree DNA. As I mentioned in my previous webinar, there are some other companies that will tell you your haplogroup for, a, for your Y chromosome for a small added cost, but that information is generally not enough to conduct good surname research if that's what you're interested in. So if you're really wanting to research your surname and determine your relationship to other people with your same surname that you're interested in, then family tree DNA is the way to go. There's uh, about four different levels of testing that I've got listed here, and the price points are listed, though there's currently a sale. So for instance, the the minimum test of the Y37 is currently on sale for $129, though that sale ends pretty soon. And I'll talk a little bit on the next slide about the levels of testing and what they mean. So there's 37, 67, 111 marker tests, and then big 700. In most cases, if you have a Y-DNA test, a Y-DNA question, start with the 37 you can upgrade later if it's necessary. If you match 37 of 37 markers with someone, especially if you share a surname, there's 95% odds that you share an ancestor on that male line in the last seven generations and 90% that it's in the last five. We can make those specific predictions with Y-DNA because of the predictable rate at which it changes. If there's any sort of uncertainty say you match somebody 35 markers and you're trying to determine just a little bit more specifically how closely related you are or if it's a more recent relationship that you're trying to prove for sure, that's a point at which you could upgrade to one of those other tests or if you're just really super interested to see what mutations you have. The nice thing about with family tree DNA, whether it's the mtDNA or the Y-DNA test you take, if you decide later you want to upgrade, they save your sample. They can reprocess it and check it for more markers. You just have to pay the upgrade fee. So in very rare instances, they need you to retest if your sample is not good anymore. But if so, they'll provide you a kit to do that with. And this page just shows you an example of what Y-DNA test results can look like. It, it shows you your values, which markers you have mutations on. It can tell you your haplogroup as well, though I don't think this has a screenshot of, of that information. The haplogroup is sort of ancient ethnic origins. The mutations are what tell you how closely you match someone. So kind of the key formula is surname matches, if the markers match, you've got a recent genealogical relationship. There are cases where you share a lot or even all of your markers with someone, but not a surname. And that can be a case where some sort of name change took place in either your family or the other person's line. So that's something to investigate of, you know, was there an illegitimacy? Did somebody have a name change because they immigrated, etc.? So this is an example of someone's uh, match list. This is how you kind of determine how closely you're related to another person who's tested on the Y line. You can look at their earliest known ancestor info to see if that gives you any clues. You can contact them by clicking on their name and collaborate on how you might be related. This can be really helpful if you have a roadblock. Let's say your line only, only goes back to the 1850s and you can't trace it any further, whereas Theirs goes back to the 1770s and they match you 36 or 37 out of 37 markers. Then you can focus on the family of their further back ancestors and try and figure out where the connection is. So we're going to talk a little bit more on the next slide about what really is 
a high, oh, sorry. We already talked about that. The high level matches, which is the, how many markers you match. So on the left-hand side here, you'll see Family Tree DNA's um, search page where you can find surname or geographical projects. You don't have to join a surname project to find matches in the database. By testing, you can just automatically um, find matches of anybody who's been tested in the entire database who is closely related to you. You can filter it by, you know, I want only 37 marker matches or I want, you know, anybody down to 35 out of 37 or 30 out of 37, whatever you're curious in. But the surname projects can be really helpful to your own research because these projects are a gathering place for researchers interested in the same surname you're interested in or even geographically or other kinds of projects. So you can join a surname project if one already exists for your surname or you can start one if there isn't one already. You won't always match people with your same surname because that's not always how surnames originated. You may not even match many people closely at all, depending on who's tested. For example, my husband's done the Y test. He doesn't have really any close matches, period, let alone anybody with his last name of Stoddard. There are a lot of American Stoddards and even some British Stoddards that is tested. He knows that his origins probably are Brit British, but he doesn't have any close matches in the project. However, it's really useful to be aware of even if these people don't match you of who they are and where their ancestors came from because that can help you as you're looking through records to figure out okay these are my people these aren't my people and often in these groups you run into dedicated genealogists who whether you're DNA related or not you share a surname that they're also interested in and they're willing to help and share information that they've found in their research. The right-hand side picture is just sort of an example of a homepage of a Y-DNA surname project, which is the homepage of the Woodall surname project. Woodall's my maiden name, and the Woodall surname project is actually a great example of the kinds of discoveries that can be made when you do Y-DNA research. So going back into the 1970s, there were several very dedicated researchers of the Woodall surname in the United States. They lived in various states. They did a lot of the old school hard work of tracing the early American carriers of this surname in census records, tax lists, court records, et cetera, interviewing elderly relatives, all, all of the really, you know, backbreaking kind of work of genealogy at the time. My dad started researching his line in the 1980s and had hit a roadblock for a while a few generations back from him. And so he was extremely grateful to come into contact with some of these researchers in the 1990s and get some help with his line. Several of these researchers, they put out books, they held reunions for the Woodall lines they'd researched back to a common ancestor in colonial Virginia. So in about 2005, my dad and three of these longtime researchers decided to start a Woodall surname project for Y-DNA testing and get as many Woodalls as they could to test. They hoped this would help future researchers and possibly help them all trace the family out of Virginia and into England, especially if we could get some English Woodalls to test. However, the DNA results just for these four group founders contained some interesting surprises that showed that the story of the early American Woodalls was a little more complex than they thought. One researcher by the name of Verna had male relatives in her family test since she didn't carry the Y chromosome, and their DNA showed that their direct male line was actually of Native American descent. Another researcher named Andy uncovered an illegitimacy where an ancestor took his mother's surname Woodall rather than his father's surname since his parents were not married. And then my dad, Jeff, and the fourth researcher, Steve, discovered that they belonged to two different Y-DNA haplogroups, even though their common ancestor was supposedly a man who died in the 1750s in Virginia and left two adult sons named John and William. My dad came through William's line, supposedly, and this other researcher, Steve, came through John's line. Since then, they've had 
more relatives test and it's become apparent that anybody who thinks they descend from William pretty much has one Y DNA signature, whereas those that come from John have a different one. We don't know at this point because this was the 1750s if one of these sons was a stepson, if one of them was illegitimate, or if maybe we've mixed up multiple men living in the same area with the same names. But it's it's given us something to investigate and a way to sort people in the future who come up with one of these two Y-DNA signatures. So the picture to the right is my dad and these other three researchers at one of the reunions they held in the early 2000s before they kind of figured all this out. And after decades of research and collaborating, the Y-DNA results that showed that none of them were related in the way they thought were kind of shocking to them. But I, I love this response that my dad emailed to the others as they were all trying to come to terms with the, the new story that the DNA was telling. He said, as we chart our family past the fourth generation, we are no longer relying on modern hard facts or the firsthand testimony of surviving or relatively recently deceased ancestors. Any combination of misunderstood paper gleanings, as well as the possibility of the grafting in of other DNA types, would give us the DNA patchwork our what all surname project has thus far produced. However, just look at the friendships we have grown in the larger network of Woodall researchers we have developed. There's nothing wrong with our results or past efforts. It just means that instead of having an absolute certainty about the paper trails developed in the past, we need to open up our investigations to other possibilities, both paper-wise and DNA-wise. The two evidence methods complement each other, but neither one is an end-all solution for a genealogy mystery. So I hope that as you go about DNA testing, whether it's Y DNA testing or any other kind, you can keep this same sort of openness about whether whatever results you may receive and recognize that DNA is just another piece of uh, solving the never-ending mystery of your roots. So just kind of as a conclusion, if you get your results and you would like some help with them, you um, are welcome to come if you're in the area to the BYU library. We have plenty of volunteers that are happy to help here on the second floor. It's an excellent idea to build out your tree as much as you can on whatever line you're researching, be it an mtDNA line, a Y-DNA line, or anything else, and attach the your tree and oldest ancestors to your DNA results on Family Tree DNA's website if it's one of those two that you've tested. Also joining a surname or region project if applicable I highly recommend. It's a great way to collaborate with others that are interested in the same kind of research that you're doing. And again at the end here I have some helpful links. Um, these links one of them's a repeat, but mo most of them are new as compared to last week, last time's webinar. They specifically deal with Y-DNA and MT-DNA to be able to understand them some more and understand what kind of research you can do with them. And that's all I have for today. I'd love to take questions whenever we're ready to do that. So it looks like we have a couple questions. Um, one viewer asked, um, what's the difference between living DNA? Um, the test includes uh, Y, mitochondria, and, and autosomal versus uh, family tree DNA. Yes. So that's a, that's a perfect question. Um, the living DNA package that currently includes the Y DNA and the MT DNA testing, they will tell you your haplogroup information. So, you know, which region of the world that line comes from, which may be all you need for whatever research you're doing. But the family tree DNA versions of those tests, they not only tell you the haplogroup information, but they tell you information about specific mutations you have that could differentiate you between other people that share that same haplogroup with you. So especially with Y-DNA, those mutations are what are going to tell you how closely you actually are related to someone else's tested and not just that, oh, both of you have a Y chromosome that originated in Northwestern Europe. 
And we have another question. Um, is mitochondrial DNA the same as uh, X DNA? That's another good question. I almost mentioned something about that in my presentation, but I didn't know if it would be too confusing. So it is not. Mitochondrial DNA is not on any of your 23 chromosomes. Mitochondria are a specific part of your cells that produce energy. It's a very unique kind of DNA because it's different from the rest of your genome. It almost seems like it maybe had origins as some sort of parasitic uh, entity. But um, xDNA is one of your 23 chromosomes. You get an X chromosome from your mother and your father if you're female. You only get it from your mother if you're male because you get a Y from your father. So there are research things you can do by looking at xDNA. For instance, if... Um, if two women have an identical match on an X chromosome, then they will know that they shared the same father because they would get that from him because that's all he could pass down in terms of xDNA. But that is, xDNA is not inherited just along that female line, the way mitochondrial DNA is. You can have xDNA from a number of your ancestral lines because you can inherit it from both your mother and father, depending on your gender and depending on which parents they got that from. And I may include that the next time I do a, a webinar is a little bit more of a discussion of xDNA and how you can and can't use it. It's a little bit more complicated than mitochondrial DNA. All right. I think that's all the questions that we have. Uh, if you have any more questions, you're welcome to type them in. But I'm going to move over to the closing announcements. So our next webinar will be on um, the 5th. Uh, that'll be a Thursday at 3 p.m. Mountain uh, Standard Time. Catherine Grant will be giving a presentation on the Family Search Gallery and all the tips and tricks for that. And then uh, the 12th of September, um, that hasn't been finalized. The topic hasn't been finalized yet, uh, but it will be posted um, in it shortly. And then after that, we'll have a webinar with Brandon Plew. He'll be giving a presentation on Mormon places. And then... Um, the week after that, we'll have a presentation with James, Ta James Tanner. Um, he was re recently in Amsterdam uh, at a conference, so he's going to update us on uh, all the changes at MyHeritage. If you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to email me at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or visit our website, which is fh.lib.byu.edu. Thank you so much, and I hope that you have a wonderful weekend.